What's going on, everybody? This is Black Men Sundays. I'm your host, Corey Sylvester Murray, and we're talking about generational wealth. We're talking about finance. And of course, we're talking about business. It's a Black Man Sunday. Time to put all childish things away. I refuse to be the man I was yesterday. Gotta put my best foot forward and elevate. And before we introduce today's guest, my man Eric from Hunts Vegas, the pretty boy from Alabama A&M University. Who do you have for our Black Men Sunday Spotlight, my brother? Hey, man, I really appreciate that intro, man. You know, it's all love. It's number love. Hey, I got two spotlights I want to do. Very short, and quick, and simple. First one spotlight, and we're going to congratulate Venus and Serena Wing. One well, probably asked me why. Well, guess what? These two sisters are the first two black females to own an NFL team. They actually owners or got my stake in the Miami Dolphins. How about that? Worth about four billion dollars. In that some first time, hey, that's positive love. We're gonna show them some love and let's support those dolphins. Second thing of my uh, spotlight for today, we want to give a shout out to Monica, who the single Monica out of the ATL. Now what especially about Monica for her son's 18th birthday, she gave him $18,000 to invest in, strictly to invest in, to show how to make money work for itself. So she's teaching her son at an early age all about um, investing and having something back for years to come. Those are my two spotlights for today, uh, Corey, and back to you. Yeah, we're going to have to get Monica on the show. We're going to get Venus and Serena on the show. They're making big power moves, man. We're definitely going to have to do that. But it's time to introduce today's guest. We have John Paul Reed. This brother is a graduate of FAMU. This brother's from Jackson, Mississippi. You heard my, I tried to do a little Jackson accent when I said Reed. I was trying to do that on purpose. This brother's a professional baseball player. This brother founded Pure Momentum LLC. And this brother's the owner of Athlete University. We're going to find out what all that is. This brother's a community leader, a life coach. This brother worked in the nonprofit sector. So we're going to hit all that this Black Men Sundays. But first and foremost, John Paul Reed, how you doing, brother? Welcome to Black Men Sundays. Oh, man, I feel blessed to be joining you guys on this Sunday, man. Tremendously blessed. You also a fam, you rattler. I'm a fam, you rattler. So let's go on and get started, man. You played professional baseball. You played for fam, you. Let's talk about Pure Momentum LLC. What is that? Uh, Pure Momentum is an a organization that, that specializes in development and exposure for student athletes. So it's one part development, one part exposure, one part mentorship, one part uh, recruitment services. So imagine... Imagine not knowing, imagine a parent that has a kid that has a talent in the sport, but they're not sure the route. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure, sure who they should listen to. So we kind of come in and help them manage some of these situations because it's a, it's a journey. You know what I mean? Um, taking a kid from start to finish is a, is, a, is a marathon and you need the right people in your corner to make sure you're making the right steps. Um, and also to offer that tough love in certain situations. Definitely. And let's talk about, I mean, as I um, intro you, I said you are you were a professional baseball player. So how has playing sports? I mean, you basically played sports all your life. You were a four sport athlete. How did playing baseball, but playing sports in general, especially being a professional player, how did that help shape your life to want to start a pure momentum LLC? Like where did the love come from? I think initially you sort of gravitate towards certain things as a kid. My upbringing kind of led me to being back in the day, man, we came up, we were outside kids, man. We ran around, we played outside. So a lot of the camaraderie, a lot of the socialization we got came from sports. Um, you know, we would play basketball for part of the day. Then we would play football for part of the day. Um, we would play bas baseball for part of the day. Um, so it, it was more, it was more just something that I always kind of gravitated to. A lot of my um, cousins played sports. I had an uncle that was a, a Harlem Globetrotter. So I, I had that influence as a kid going to Chicago and um, going to the courts and playing with them. It was the camaraderie, I think, initially, the brotherhood that I was kind of like I gravitated to. And it was also like the, the, the ability to like focus and learn something that people thought you weren't good at. You know, you could develop your own skill. And in these sports, and you could track your own progress. You know, it was, um, I think also, too, for me, um, it was a lot of team building, a lot of, like, leadership skills and qualities that I that I, that I I wanted and that I saw a lot of athletes with, like, you know, quarterbacks. 
they're leaders of men. You know, uh, being point guard, you have to be the guy that understands the information and can kind of orchestrate the team on the on the court. Being the pitcher, you were the person that had the ball first and everybody had to kind of like take your cue. Nothing could happen. So I liked the spotlight, but I also wanted the the qualities that went with the with the fame, so to speak. You know what I mean? I always knew that, you know, being in the environment I was raised in, I didn't want that to be my end goal. I wanted to elevate past where I was. And I knew I needed a certain skill set. So sports was probably the easiest way to accumulate these skills that I needed to kind of like impress people along the way to give me opportunities. So I will probably say that. Definitely. And let's go back to uh, pure momentum for a little bit, because I feel like, you know, what that's all about is really giving back to the community is really giving back to the kids. It's, and, you know, our show is about generational wealth. So when we're talking about pure momentum, LLC, how is that helping kids get mentally and physically ready, but also get ready to establish generational wealth? Man, I would probably say it was a passion, man. Um, I'm a person that believes that if you, if you do something you're passionate about, you know, it's not real work. So I knew that I needed to develop something that could help other people. Once I got done playing pro ball, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I started training kids, right? And and actually in the middle of before, so I was playing and then I had a car accident. And then the car accident kind of caused me to kind of take a pause. I didn't know whether I was finished or not. But once you get past a certain point, it's expensive going to these camps, and these tryouts. So I was like, okay, let me go ahead and start earning some money while I'm doing this. So this is my responsibility. So I started training kids and, you know, kind of developing a, a style, a teaching style, a method for a kind of training. And I would notice that the kids started doing very well, like the kids that I would train. But um, I also started seeing that these kids, just because they could, they had the talent and the skill set, it didn't mean that they were given an opportunity to play. Right. So the kids that I was training they were developing, but they weren't being able, they weren't given an opportunity to show the skills that they were accumulating. So I decided to create a platform, right? A platform for these kids to kind of use to get an opportunity, to get known. So it, was, it wasn't like, you know, Jane Doe or John Doe showing up to this workout. It was, hey, this is a, this is a trainee of pure momentum, right? And so what we've established initially is a platform for student athletes to one get exposure, one develop the skill set, and then two be exposed to the market. And so, what we try to do is try to facilitate that uh, from start to finish with the kids and families that are a part of our organization. Now, when you say the market, which market are you talking about? Okay, let's look at it from a collegiate standpoint, because from a from a business standpoint and from a personal standpoint, we go about this trying to get kids into college, right? Um, I don't deal with kids that just want to play in high school because at the end of the day, once you make that, once you achieve that goal, once you're on the JV team, you've achieved your goal, right? So when we say the market, I mean the market of collegiate sports, colleges giving kids opportunities to further their education and personal development, right? So when we have a student, say we have a student athlete and the kids says, coach, I want to play in college, okay? So what we do is we create, a program or a developmental program, a template for this kid to get from, from where they are to where they want to be. Now, a part of that process is identifying schools that are possible opportunities for this kid to work into. But we have to we have to go through and look at the last two or three recruiting classes and see what kind of what kind of athletes that they're bringing in. Do you translate to those kind of athletes? And then we try to identify which schools um, are good fits for kids. We try to uh, we also try to take their interests into account, like what are their personal interests? So there are things that they could actually study when they get into school. Um, so there's a there's a few different things that we kind of take into account um, when we're working or deciding to take a client on. Um, but the end goal is to get these kids an opportunity to get to college. Now from college, you know, if you have that personal drive and desire and skill set to kind of push yourself into the professional ranks, that shows a little bit later. But what we do is we've created a foundation for kids and parents to get an opportunity to go to college. That's our that's our seven point. That's what we do. Definitely. And you're based in the Orlando, Florida area. Let's talk about uh, Athlete University. That kind of you kind of led right into this next question. Let's talk about um, you're the owner of Athlete University. 
based out of Sanford, Florida. Let's talk about what that is. That's kind of an interesting story. Uh, so Pure Momentum is our parent company, right? Um, and with that, I'll kind of double back and then lead right into it. So Pure Momentum was a concept of, I didn't know what I was creating when I created this thing, right? So I didn't, I, but I also didn't want it to like pigeonhole me or keep me from getting in a lot of different things because I'm a person who's interested in finance. I'm a person who's, who's interested in wealth. I'm a person who's interested in, in community. I'm a, I'm interested in family. I'm, I'm a, I'm a I'm an eclectic, complicated individual, just like most of us, right? So I wanted something that would give me the flexibility to grow. And I didn't want to have to have all these 10 different companies, right? So I decided that I was going to come up with Pure Momentum. So the idea is, I didn't know, even from its inception, I didn't know what I wanted it to be, but I knew that it needed to start and it needed to grow. So I kind of came up with the concept of everything needs momentum to develop. And so Pure Momentum PM became the, the concept, right? So we created the company and it was basically a training organization and it kind of developed into like um, outreach, community outreach, you know, services that we offer for kids. So once I got the, the platform, right, Pure Momentum as this platform off of the ground, I started coming into contact issues where financially training is 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 expensive, right? Development is expensive. Any in any in any walk of life. I don't care if you're looking, if you're talking about piano lessons, if you're talking about any kind of extracurricular training or development, costs extra money. So I was I was playing with the idea that a lot of the clients that I had, especially now that the world was becoming a lot more virtual, of the idea of taking creating an online platform for my kids to come onto my website and actually like look at my video tutorials and lock in the ad and some of my athletes in and creating this platform where parents could, I could offer this service at a, at a fraction of the price, but still give them the quality if they were committed to development and want to be a part of the program. So at the university at the beginning was and is an online, uh, a virtual athlete university if you will where they can go and learn different things and connect with different athletes and videos and learn sports from guys that are real people and that and that are going to give them some real world advice and um direction so initially athlete university was our online virtual school that we created as a platform for athletes to get extra training um and then what happened was through pure momentum and our philosophy, you know, our, our, our three-step motto, you know, crawl, walk, run, it, it kind of grew. And then we turned Athlete University into a storefront, right? So now Athlete University is also our physical, um, is the physical location where we kind of manage our, our philosophy, which is pure momentum, right? So we've taken that concept and we've created a physical storefront where people can actually come in and get, physical services, right? So one, I guess to sum it up, one, it was started off as an online like tutorial type of situation. And then it kind of like morphed into a brick and mortar kind of concept. As we're talking about from like a business perspective, what was your business model going in with Pure Momentum LLC and Athlete University for the current business owners that may want to venture into another business and for the brothers right. that may have fear, of, but they want to start a business? I'm going to be a hundred percent transparent. So initially when I started Pure Momentum, man, you know, it was just, Hey, look, I have a desire. I, I know I want to create a business and I'm good at articulating and, and, and communicating with, with people and athletes. So boom, we started Pure Momentum. I started doing well, created the logo. I actually etched out the logo. Like I drew it myself, you know? So I went through the whole creative process and then boom. Um, so the initial idea was Pure Momentum was the parent company it was the only company, but what happened was once I decided to create this other stream of revenue, which was Athlete University, which was the virtual online stuff, um, it kind of morphed into something different, right? Now, at the same time, I actually started Pure Momentum when I was living in Jackson, Mississippi. I started, we had a summer team, which is like travel baseball. We had a summer team. We put some kids together. Um, those kids did really well. I actually have two of those kids currently who are actually in minor league baseball. Um, so that was the start of the company, which was the which is the proof of concept. Right. So then once that happened, I um, I was, you know, I decided to move, relocate to Orlando. Um, I was getting married. So I got married and relocated. So I started the business here. Right. So initially I started the business. 
I, I, you know, I created the LLC, went through the fictitious name search, um, you know, got the EIN, you know, did all of that. And then I held it for a little while because I had to build a client base, right? So transitioning from one place to the next, you could, I just couldn't jump in and just start because I was going to have to pay rent. I was going to have to do a lot of stuff. So I kind of came in and used my ability to kind of like connect with organizations and people. And I started working with the local organization, which at the time was called the uh, Central Florida Wolverines, Wolves, Wolverines, uh, which was a travel baseball organization. And I started to build my client base. I came in uh, training kids, doing athletes, just doing everything, pitching, hitting, fielding. I know you name it, I do it, right? So I build a client base and the luck and way way things work i already had the llc just kind of waiting but building the client base and on the weekends i would do in my training and i would do it under pure momentum i would log it you know it's very important as a side note for or for for business owners and young entrepreneurs understand that you have to create a paper trail you have to create a record of what you're doing right so even though i was working for the wolverines i made them pay me as pure momentum you get what i'm saying like so i was creating a record of my company. My biggest thing is, and I do this with people that work with me. I don't want when our when our relationship ends, be it be it you know cordial or not. I don't want that to be the end of what you're building, and I don't want I don't want to take what you built, and I didn't want anybody to take what I was establishing. So it's very important to establish your get your paperwork and establish your your business so you can create a record of your business doing business. So you can project that and you can let clients know that you're already doing business. And it's as simple as just having people establishing your, your LLC and having people paying you as a 1099 contract labor. They're just paying your company instead of, you know, the individual. Um, and that's a practice that I have because I believe in teaching people the business side of it. So I did that and I was getting paid under my business, my company. Um, so then what happened was look, how, how fate has it. The guy that I was working for sold his business to a bigger company, which was a bad idea. I kind of talked to him about, hey, let me come in and, you know, helping you. Because most what happens is in youth sports, everybody, people don't realize it, but there comes a point where, you know, just playing the games isn't good enough and the kids need physical development, right? And a lot of organizations, especially the ones that deal in the youth area, they're not really good at physical development and getting athletes from little league to middle school or middle school to high school, right? Because for athletes to transition to, this is the thing, when you move from middle school to high school, you're playing with older kids. So our philosophy is, I don't care what sport it is, as a 14-year-old, as a you have to be able to go out there and physically compete with 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. And you have to do this because most of the colleges now are not recruiting the current year's class, right? Meaning, so if this is 2023, None of the big time schools are recruiting 2023s. They're recruiting 2024s, 2025s, 2026s. So the reality is, as a parent or as a kid that's playing, you have to be able to compete with people two and three years older than you, right? And so my philosophy is, as a trainer, as an organization, if I'm not, if I'm not, if I'm not training you to that level, I'm not preparing you for what you're going to have to do, right? So, so that's kind of that. Now I'm gonna kind of flip back to kind of like the model. So. COVID hit. So I, I boom, I, the organization that I was working with, guy calls me and tells me, hey, man, you know, I'm finna sell. What do you want to do? You can go to the company because he was selling out and working for the other company. So he was like, hey, you can either come with me. I got a spot for you or you can kind of, you know, do your own thing. I was like, yeah, this is probably the time where I need to do my own thing because I've been working. I had already kind of like established a client base. I started kind of building a side client base anyway. And I was thinking about telling him I was going to make that transition just because it's hard to like be led when you're a leader, especially when you're, when you have such strong ideals on what you're trying to do from the business, right? You know, they were just training kids. I wanted to motivate and inspire. So it was, I felt like I was being handicapped. So he sold the business, everything kind of split. And so boom, I decided, I told my wife, hey, look, I'm ready to jump out there. So we started looking for a facility, looking for a building. Boom, found a building. Uh, this was, this was 2019. It's probably the summer of 2019, um, pre COVID. So this is kind of like leading up to this, your question. So 2019 hit, you know, the summertime, we found a building, we're going through the process, you know, it was all, it was a grassroots hands on deck kind of thing. Um, build, finding a facility, uh, painting it, putting all the turf in, finding the guy to do the nets. You know, I never did the, been through the process, but I'm doing it right. So boom, 
um, get everything ready to go. So we finally get all the paperwork, all the certifications. Uh, we get uh, at the university, uh, you know, um, certified with the city. So we're going to go with that. And boom, we January hits, January 2020 hits. We open up, we officially open up and then boom, March hits and COVID hits, right? So my traditional business of having a uh, your traditional training facility academy kind of gym kind of morphed into nothing, <laughs> right? It was real. At this moment, my my background and my upbringing kind of kicked in and, and I'm a little different. I, as a saying, like I have a saying, one of my, I'm a, I'm a fan of Big Crit, right? I'm from Mississippi, right? And Big Crit, as a saying, I'm too country to quit, right? And so... My mindset was I didn't lose a business. I had to build a business either way. And I think that that kind of mindset allowed me to kind of like be appreciative of whatever I had and try to hold on to what I got. So um, and 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 my wife is a beast. Um, you know what I'm saying? So what happened was, I mean, literally January, March hit and we had no clients because COVID. Everybody was in the house. So here comes the pivot. You know what I mean? Um, so instead of um, kind of giving up and kind of having this mindset of like this defeated, you know, depressed kind of mindset. What we ended up doing was transitioning our um, our Athlete University into an after school program, right? So what we did was we became licensed through DCF, um, and we went through that that process. The state of Florida was offering at that time an exemption for after school program, so it became easy to become an after school program because they needed facilities to be open because parents still had to go to work right so throughout the entire COVID we were able to stay open and still kind of build a base and start developing and connect with clients because of this uh exemption right and so the exemption probably lasted like a year year and a half and during that time my wife went and got her credentials and got licensed through the DCF officially I did the same thing she got a director's license I I'm like one class away from my director's license so now we operate as a DCF licensed uh, care provider that only operates with with school aged children, so we don't do like daycares, right? So a lot of times people think DCF and um, care providers as like you know daycares, right? We're not a daycare because we don't um, operate during school hours and we only take school aged children, right? And so our concept is you know discipline through a sports, the base theme. So instead of your kid after school going to an after school program where they're, you know, sitting in a classroom, eating cookies, waiting on somebody to come, they're going to come with us. They got a, they got a workout regimen. They're going to come in, they're going to run their 20 minutes. They're going to get a snack. If they got homework, we got tutors to come in and help them. Um, and we're, we're actually helping them develop this skill set um, of, of whatever they, their de desired interest is. And if they don't have an interest, the only thing that we require is that they be open minded and willing to do some physical activity and learn a skill based on what we think their attributes, the temperament, body language, tone will lead them to. And so that's kind of what has sustained us in the beginning. And of course, now um, I have a lot of high school kids that I'm working with. Um, so that part of the business began to pick back up. So that's kind of what happened. The business model was an academy training development and it, we had to pivot due to COVID. And through that pivot, we found a blessing. You know what I mean? And now because of, you know, we got a van, we pick kids up, we transport them, we pick them up from school. We're licensed through DCF. Um, and because of it, you know, it has pretty much allowed us, one, to stay in business through COVID, which a lot of businesses just had to fold. But it also gave us, a unique niche that no one else, a lane that really no one else is in. Great information, man. One thing you mentioned, you said uh, you and your wife got your director's license. What was the importance of getting that? Well, you don't want to put, it's like a child, right? Our business is our, our child. We don't want to put our child in the hands of somebody that hasn't been there and that doesn't understand what we're trying to build or how we're trying to raise our child. So it was very important for us in the beginning to make sure that we were the ones who were going to be there and be responsible. We didn't want to pass that off. You know, we could have easily found a director, but I, I'm a big person on knowing the process, understanding the process first. So if I do bring somebody in, one, I've already done the job. And then two, 
I can really instruct them on X, Y, Z on what they're going to do. And if they can't comply with that, then we just can't coexist in this kind of capacity. Right. So the biggest thing was just like, hey, look, like this is ours. We're the only ones that really understand it because we created it. You know what I mean? Like there's no one else in this lane. Um, so we have to be the ones that take ownership and responsibility for both sides of it. That's the care side. That's the and the training side. Right. The training side kind of comes naturally to me. So it was very important to me to really, really kind of get in and day and get my hands in on the care side of it from a from a DCF, from a from a from a, from a child care perspective, not just, oh, man, the kid's OK you know, quit being soft. You know what I mean? Like that's easy to take that approach, but in some situations you have to kind of realize that there has to be a checks and balance in place to make sure everything goes smoothly. So that was kind of the motivation to like really, really understand it. So we could grow it, not just, you know, have this and just kind of sit on it. The goal was to expand and grow. And that's kind of where we are kind of in mid expansion mode right now. Definitely. And, you know, when I speak to a lot of parents, I'm a mentor in my community in Apopka, Florida, um, you know, but I'm, I travel around to the schools as well. And I speak to a lot of parents all the time at different award ceremonies, amazing shake. And a lot of parents say, how do we inspire our children? Because our children, you know, with the Internet, with social media, they learn so much so quickly that when a right. parent tries to teach them, oh, I already know that, mom. You waste, I already know, I already know that. So I feel like a lot of parents, when they tell me, I feel like the kids feel like they know everything. So how are you guys able to motivate and inspire the youth? That's not an easy answer, but it's as a formula, right? And everything, every kid is different. I think the biggest thing that you got to do as a parent, and this is just me, I'm a proponent of this. And I think this is something that the schools need to like look into um, implementing is every kid should be a part of some kind of extracurricular activity, right? So the concept here is passion. Any human being, like just not even a kid, any human being that doesn't isn't passionate about something isn't going to be motivated. So the question is, what are you passionate about? If the only thing you're passionate about is your phone, well, that's not going to lead in most situations to that individual developing some investable skill set, okay? All right? So the whole idea is finding a passion, finding something the kid really loves to put themselves in. Now, we have to understand that every kid isn't going to be an athlete, right? So a big part of like even our program, we have an audiovisual portion of what we do. Uh, we have video editing. We have, I have, a, um, I have an artist that comes out and I have a magician that comes out, right? You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, I also connected with um, a, a, a brother out. Uh, who runs a, a pilot school. And I got one of my kids, he, and funniest story, Israel no longer plays baseball. He's, he he's flies planes. Like, he's a pilot. He's working to be a pilot. So the biggest thing we got to understand is, as mentors, we are there to, like, help a kid find their way, even if it's not my way, right? Even if it takes money out of my pot, right? I have to put the kid first. I have to try to be a vessel and I have to try to be a person that can steer and lead the child towards his passion. Um, I got to understand that, Hey, every kid is coming from some different situation at the house. You know, um, I tell you another thing that's important. Um, commitment is, is, is of the utmost importance. I don't take on a client without sitting down, talking to the parents and under, and, and making sure that they understand that we are a team, you know, mom, and me are a team, dad and me are a team, the kid and me are a team, and we are a team, right? And that the team has to be on the same page, right? What are the goals? What are the expectations? Um, are we going to reinforce and, 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 and back each other, you know, as the authoritative uh, point of the group? You know what I mean? Um, but I think identifying that passion is essential. Controlling the kid's time as a parent, the one thing you control is your kid's time and movement, right? And you have to take ownership and responsibility for your child's movement and time because there's going to come a point where you don't have as much control, right? Or you don't have as much leverage is what I like to call it. And when you lose the leverage, you lose. If, if when you lose the leverage, the kid isn't focused on something, you're going to lose the kid because 
they're going to find something that piques their interest. It just depends on when and where they find it. Right. And so my mom always made sure I was in activities and I found that thing that I liked. You know what I mean? I did tons, but this is the thing. I did tons of things. Like looking at my background, you probably wouldn't know that I I took tap dance. I did, you know, uh, tumbling as a kid. I used to give speeches at the mall. I used to think it was the corniest thing ever. I used to like have to stand up there at the mall and give the I have a dream speech. You know what I mean? Um, I was I sang. I my mom just not only was supportive in the sports part of it she made sure that i was well rounded and i think that so much of what we do now we, we're going away from like putting our kids in positions where they have to adjust and adapt and we're like oh i don't want to force them i want it to be their decision right my philosophy is the kid doesn't know anything so how how can we leave all the decision making to someone who hasn't had experience on making decisions Someone who who doesn't understand what sacrifice is. Someone who doesn't understand what you know, love, dedication. You know what I mean? Like, the, like, like the biggest thing I think people fail to realize is like, love isn't like being and giving anything someone wants. Dedication is a portion of love. Like, sacrifice is in love. Like, love is a is something that encompasses a lot of different things. And when you don't give those core values with the love, the kid is going to be void of passion and motivation. You know what I mean? So I would definitely say to parents who are struggling, you know, one, limit the phone time. Like that's the number one thing, right? Because if the kid is 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 on the phone, they're probably not jogging while they're on the phone. They're probably not doing anything active and they become sedentary. You know what I'm saying? Just the concept, like, I'm a big time guy, right? I had this big spiel that I do when I go and I talk to my high school kids. So um, I put 24 hours on the board and we go through and we say, hey, how many hours do you sleep? Okay, six hours. Okay, how many hours are you at school? Okay, six hours. Are you in any extracurricular activities? Okay, that takes two or three hours. Okay, then you got your homework. All right, so most, most kids who are involved in some kind of extracurricular, they're gonna have about three to four hours at the end of the day, right? Okay. So, boom, once we go through all of this, now I ask the big question where I become the devil with the horns out. I say, pull your phones out, right? Now I want to know what your screen time is, right? So if you've got two or three hours left at the end of the day, which is what I call your personal development time, right, through our program, that's the time you take to develop your personal skill set, right? If you've got six, seven hours of phone time a day, there, you're actually in negative time. You're taking time from either sleep or studies when you're supposed to be studying or in school, and you're actually not focused on the information, and you're de you're eroding your actual value. You know what I mean? And you're taking away all of your personal development time. Even as an athlete, when I go to practice, that's not my personal development time. That's the time where I'm learning how to be a good teammate or I'm learning team concepts. But if I don't have a certain skill set, the coach isn't going to desire me to be on the team. So I have to take my personal time and learn a different skill. Just like a person in a job. If you are at a job you don't like and you want to transition out of it, how are you going to, what, what time are you going to use to learn a new skill? Where, what skill, when are you going to take time to learn about the stock market? When are you going to take time to learn about uh, real estate and, you know, affiliate marketing? You can't just jump into these arenas. You have to do research and learn and study, right? And so my biggest thing to my kids is college buys us time. It by my biggest thing, and this is just me, and I'm gonna take a pause here because I feel like I should give you the opportunity to kind of inject. But what I'm trying to do as a black man, or as a, as a father, or as a, as, a, as a provider, as a person, is buy all of my time back. I want to purchase my time back, and I do that by earning a certain amount of money. The more I earn, the more of my time I can buy back. So for a high school student or for a middle school student. You've got to develop a personal skill set so people give you an opportunity to develop more, right? But if you don't, you're going to have to jump right into the workforce and you're not going to have any time. You're losing your time, right? So the concept is 10,000 hours. Everybody's heard it, right? It takes 10,000 hours to be great at something, right? So if it takes 10,000 hours to become great at something at 
2,500 hours or 3,000 hours, you become, what's the word, appealing enough for me to invest in you and give you a scholarship. You get what I'm saying, right? But if we're not accumulating these hours in this development, we're going to have to go to that pool of people that's making, set them, you know, they're making marginal money. And that's the biggest pool of people that exist. That and the people that have given up on trying to, trying to buy their time back. So we don't want to be in those pool of people. We have to separate ourselves from our peers, right? And we do that by taking our personal development time or for our, for our business that those hours between the hours of three and six, right? Three and seven to develop the skill set. And that's kind of what we try to do. And that's the focus, right? Let's find this kid, find what the kid likes. Once you find what he likes, now you can set some standards and some boundaries and some, some expectations. But until the kid, I don't care if it's music or rapping, whatever it is, we've got to identify that, that passion. Because if it's not that, then their fear is getting whipped or their fear is some kind of negative, you know, feedback. And that's going to lead them into being fearful and not being a leader. It's going to lead them into being a follower and depressed. You know what I'm saying? As a person that played sports growing up, I had the pleasure of having a parent that was a referee. He ref games. But the best part about it is we learn, you know, team. We learn how to be a team. We learn dedication, commitment, like you said. But we also learn mental toughness. We learned, okay, you know, I didn't make the, the last shot to win the game. I missed it. You know, the way I felt, now I'm going to work harder. So I feel like athletics, extracurricular act activities are very essential because when you're in the job force or you're your entrepreneur, you have your own business, you're going to have the ups and downs. You're going to have days where you just feel like you just scored 50 and you're going to have days where you're like, man, nobody walked in here. So, you know, talking to the parents of children that, you know, may just want to be in the books, but they don't really want to play any sports. They rather just sit on the phone, play on social media, stay in the air condition right. because it's hot outside, you know, right. as a parent, how do you motivate that child to get into an extracurricular activity? Here's the, the, the point where, you know, the government, the schools and the parents have to all co converge because we have to listen. Everything is virtual now. Like we have to come up with more creative ways to to teach comp com competitive nature. Right. This is my thing. And I don't care who. I don't care who disagrees with what I'm saying. They can't, they cannot refute what I'm saying, right? America is a competition-based country. Competition is wrapped up in, in, in existing in America. And I hate to say this, but discrimination is one of the ways that we decide who gets what in this country, right? If everybody had the same credentials, the same grades, the same everything, how would we decide who got what? So we use these things um, to discriminate against people, right? So my biggest thing is kids must learn a competitive nature to, to thrive in this country. If you don't have a competitive nature, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to out. You're not going to have that desire to outdo the next guy. So my thing is, oh, girl, we need to come up with poetry contests. You dig what I'm saying? We need to come up with art contests. We need to come up with like here, I'm gonna give you an idea, right? This is a this is a real baseline that I do for my kids, and I deal and I deal with uh, kids all the time that are not athletes. Um, the first thing you need to find out, and this is just a quick quick survey that you can do. I want give me three strengths, three strengths that you have, right? Three weaknesses that you have, and three interests that you have. Okay, let's just start with that, right? <clears throat> Why do we start with strengths, weaknesses, and interests? Right. Because most kids have no experience. They don't know that liking cameras, liking that, liking cameras and liking taking pictures can turn into a photography. They don't know how to bridge the gap because they haven't been in contact with people who had the experience who do it. Right. So what we need to know is what do you think you're strong at? What do you think you're weak at? And what are you? interested in and that interest is basically what three things do you pick up without anybody asking now some kids would be like the phone okay so inside of the phone what would be those three interests are you listening to music when you're on the phone are you taking pictures are you 
blogging, communicating with people. You know what I'm saying? Like we've got to figure out where, what they're spending their time doing, right? And then what we do is we take those those nine things, the three interests, the three the strengths, the three weaknesses, and we give it to somebody who's close to that person. And then we ask them, tell me the three strengths of this person, tell me the three weaknesses, and tell me three things that you think they're interested in, right? And then we start to sit down and we start to cross-reference these, these points, these data points, right? And from there, that's going to give us something that we can start with, right? <clears throat> There's no way a kid can say, I have no interest, I have no strengths, I have no weaknesses. No, that kid is just like in a habit of not and being engaged properly and not being held to a standard that you matter, right? Like when I say a standard of you matter, like literally you are either adding to this marble or you're taking away from this marble. Or this marble, I mean this planet. Right. So what are you going to leave? What is going to be your legacy? You know what I'm saying? What are you going to be known for? Like I heard somebody say this and it kind of hit me. You die twice. You die the last when you die when you leave this earth, when you leave this plane, and then you die the last time someone mentions your name. Those people whose names last a hundred years after they die, two hundred years, a thousand years, they left a legacy. So some of these legacies are infamous as some of them are great you know it's all the varying levels of it right but the reality is what are you going to leave what are people going to know you for and i think that we're in a time period now where people are so confused because their ideas are not their own ideas i remember as a kid i had so much time to myself i learned myself right i didn't have a phone in front of me to take in other people's images and other people's ideas, I created my own interests from my own ideas and playing basketball and football and interacting with my friends. So I wasn't as influenced because I didn't have something that was in my lap that could stay on for eight hours at a time and that just constantly sent me messages and images and images and images, right? The brain is an association tool, right? It doesn't, it doesn't understand words. It, it understands images, right? So what we have to understand is the only thing that exists right now is time and images. If you're awake for six hours and you're taking in negative images, you're going to be a negative person and you're going to produce negativity. If you are a person who's, a, who's awake for, eight, for three hours and you're taking in positive images, you're going to be a positive person and you're going to produce and project positivity. Right. And I think sometimes we just get so confused and we start adding things to the puzzle that don't mean anything. That's just like I deal with a lot of kids. I'm going to give you a term here and this, gonna, this is going to probably resonate with people differently. ADHD and ADD. I tell parents this. I'm not going to say it exists. I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. To me, the only thing that exists is attention span. Some people have a short attention span. Some people have a wide attention span. So my focus when I'm dealing with kids, especially the ones that have been diagnosed with these, is to increase their attention span. And how do we do that? We do that by finding things that they're interested in. If the kid has a one minute attention span, maybe that's because you haven't found anything he's interested in. You find anything he's interested in, he may have a three and a half minute attention span, right? Now we start to translate that three and a half minute attention span into other things, right? But we don't just give up and label the kid. Let's start the process of blowing the balloon up, right? If the balloon bursts, okay, let's figure out a way to make it more elastic. You did what I'm saying? Let's add materials to it. I'm a person that believes like we have all the answers we need, but a lot of times the people that are the solution oriented people don't get the support. You know what I'm saying? Like there's somebody and there's somebody somewhere that has an answer to every problem we have. The question is, are we giving that person a lab? Are we giving that person the resources? Are we giving that person the platforms? You know what I'm saying? Um, so that's 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 my take on it. You know, I think that you got to realize like, hey, your kid may be like art, right, might like to draw. Kid might like to make funny videos. Kid might like to read. I think reading is also something that parents got to start doing with their kids. I don't care how old your kid is. Your kid is never too old for you to read with them. You know what I'm saying? If they five, they're in the fifth grade and you haven't done it much, it's time to start doing it.
at the end of the day, anybody can be programmed. Anybody, if you do something for 30 days in a row, it's going to become a habit. But because it's tough, sometimes we don't do it. You know what I mean? Because the kid kicks and screams, we don't do it. But if we pick up a book and make the kid read, you know, and let them pick the book, you know what I mean? But I think like certain things we have to start ingraining in our children, right? Because at the end of the day, a person, a person that reads or that 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 reads on the regular is going to be a more a, a more learned person because they're not going to wait for information to be given to them. They're going to know how to go and get information, especially now with the internet. I feel like that's the biggest blessing of the internet is that information is at your fingertips. But the problem is so many times we don't choose what information we get. We go to these different platforms where they just kind of like sift information to us and three or four hours gone by and the kid may have watched whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like we have to take more of an active approach and role in what we're allowing them to kind of ingest. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that would be my take on it. Oh, great information, man! You enjoying yourself on Black Men Sundays, brother? Man, I, I'm having this. I'm having a lot of a lot of fun, man. Really, really, I am because I don't get to engage a lot. You know, I'm a, I'm a different kind of guy, and I I'm, and I spend so much time working and trying to come up with these solutions that I rarely get to like get with people and like really kind of like expand and and learn. I actually listened to uh the podcast that you did on um leveraging your money. You know, uh, with the gentleman from uh, what was his name? Uh, yeah, you talking about uh, the Reverend Doctor uh, Randolph Bracy Jr. And God rest his soul, he passed away, but he gave us some gems on that show. Go ahead, brother. No, he did a great job, man. It was really, 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 um, really impactful. Listen, just listening to a person tell their truth and 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 be honest about. He went to school for three years, and then they told him they tried to kick him out, and he had to kind of like look yourself in the mirror and hit the reset button. You know, so, so many times we always tell the success stories, you know, but we don't tell the part of it where he had to kind of like level up, as they say. You know what I mean? He had to step back and say, man, I, was, I wasn't I was really, really living up to the standard. I, I fell below the mark. You know, uh, I tell people, man, there's no, there's no shame in failure, right? The, the disappointment should come in the fact that you quit on yourself. You know what I mean? Um, every successful person I've ever met failed a bunch of times. You know what I mean? So it's not so much if you can be successful, it's will you do the things necessary to be successful. You know what I mean? And I tell my kids that all the time. It's not if, it's will. You know, we use this word, you don't hear people say it much anymore, your will, right? The will to survive or the will to win, the will like to not quit. Like, do you have the will to outlast the other guy. You know what I mean? Like, are you willing to do those things that, you know, uh, it was like when I talked to you earlier that you were doing some social media stuff. That's will. That's the desire, the passion, you know, the focus, the drive, all of those things. And all of us need that, whether we want to admit to it or not. You know what I mean? We need people in our corner to say, hey, bro, man, you know, you did a good job on that podcast. Or, hey, man, you know what? Like, you guys did a good, you need that. And we need to be more productive and, and positive to each other. You know what I'm saying? Go out of your way to tell somebody, man, you know what? I see what you're doing. I appreciate the effort. We need that. You know, like trying to make everybody else's day a little bit better. And communication and conversation does that, man. Like really, bro, I, I actually have like this feeling of like, like, wow. Like I, I get a chance to kind of like express some things that I feel could help people. And it's, it's probably... It feels like a massage, bro, just to be honest with you. Like, it feels really, really, really good to be able to, like, offer people some some help and insight because I've had to gain this information through trial and error. You know what I mean? No one gave me a book. I don't have a doctorate or master's in anything. Um, I just, I'm a hands-on person that works with kid, children and parents. And I know what, I know where the kids' minds are now. I know what they should be on and I know what the powers that be on the other side. I know what the barriers to entry are. You get what I'm saying? And so for parents, it's understanding like wherever your kids going to go, there's going to be a barrier to entry. You know what I mean? You know, 60 years ago, it might've been your skin color, but now that's not the case. Now the barriers to entry are, are you equipped in Google? Are you equipped in, you know, Microsoft word, 
Like, are you, do you know, are you good at cybersecurity? Like these are the new barriers to entry and we've got to figure out a way to get our kids up to speed on that. I see a lot of parents where they're really spending a lot of money. They had the kids in the AAU programs. They have the after school where they, they go to these camps where they're doing all these drills. They're getting them ready. And a lot of parents tell me, you know, my son right now, from what I'm seeing, I've seen a lot of kids. I think my son can be a pro ball player. So I'm going to give him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in his future by sending them to all these camps. So for someone that, played professional baseball that played a professional sport what advice would you give to the parents to where the kids do seem to have an exceptional talent at a young age or they're dominating the kids at a young age and then the parents are spending so much money investing thinking okay i'm gonna raise a pro player i'm gonna be 100 percent honest if they're not doing it at 18 it doesn't matter okay so all of the hopes and dreams and aspirations and the expectations it doesn't matter if they're not doing it at 18, okay? So if your kid's nine years old, realize that you've got to manage this thing for nine years. The movie, uh, King Richard, right? Uh, that movie and watching my children take swimming lessons have probably had the biggest, the most tremendous impact on me as a trainer and as a developer and even as a parent uh, who, who easily could have, taking that approach with my kids. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I want them to be this, right? And I say this for two reasons. One, the King Richard movie was so impactful because one, he did have a plan, right? He knew exactly what he wanted him to do. He had the training and the days all marked out, right? So to the naked eye, he could have seemed like an overzealous parent, right? A parent that's just putting the cart before the horse, the parent that's more excited about it than the kid. But what was really, what was really, really impressive was how he leveraged his children's talent and forced the people that saw the value in them and wanted to benefit from, from them monetarily, he forced them to give them experiences and education, right? So he didn't just let his daughters go to IMG with these people and let them let them play and do tournaments and get burnt out. He made them. He 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 made them take his entire family and move them from Compton to L.A., from Compton to Florida, and he didn't allow those girls to play. Um, shout out to your your homie that that gave Serena and Venus. You know they shout out today. He didn't allow them to play tournaments while they were like 13, 14, 15, 16. He didn't. He let them train and let them train and compete in like unsanctioned track practice matches and training events with those girls, but he didn't allow them to compete. Why not? Because he was nurturing a desire to compete. He was building their ability to have that stick to and that desire to compete once he gave them the opportunity to compete. It's very important that the, that the kid desires to compete and play when they play. If not, you're not even going to get a true baseline of where they are because they're going to be either like tired or wanting desiring to do something else you know um so here's my advice oh the other thing real quick was watching my kids swim um my kids my we put my kids my children in swimmers super early um and when i first started my wife was like yeah they're gonna do four sessions a week uh, and they're gonna be 15 minutes a piece i'm like what this is gonna be a waste of time waste of money like we're only doing it for 15 minutes but what i realized was it was more about the consistency and the touches, right? Kids get more out of 15, 20 minutes a day than three hours a week at one time because of the attention spans, right? We have to understand what the kid has the ability to do. And when I'm asking you to do something physical that translates to like something mental, it is a lot more stressful, right? It's not like, you know, having a conversation. If I'm telling you, hey, you dropping your hands while you're swinging, you're not trying to drop your hands. So every time I tell you that, you're getting agitated. You're going, you're getting mentally, you're getting mentally tied up and bogged down, right? So my advice to those parents that have kids that are showing some kind of ability and skill, understand one, your job, your number one job is to manage the appetite, okay? Manage the, the actual athlete's appetite. Meaning there's times where you got to take it away. What's your favorite food, Corey? What's your favorite food? 
uh, Chinese food or pizza, one of the two, or some What's soul your... food, probably some soul right. food. Yeah, so some let's fried say your chicken. Wife, let's say your wife cook fried chicken every day for a month. Your appetite for that isn't going to be the same. So to a large degree, your wife or that significant other, someone is responsible for your appetite, for liking that. You get what I'm saying? So as if I'm a trainer, if I'm a coach, I'm a dad, I have to take it away sometimes. Why? I have to take it away so I can make sure that the competitive fire is still there to compete when we're out there. Because that's when we're going to be judged when we're competing, right? Another thing, make sure that our training sessions aren't too long, okay? Um, and we also have to understand when we get to a point where the energy for training is just wrong, right? If we're arguing and we're back and forth and we're disagreeing, we need to go back to the drawing board on the mechanics and the fundamentals of, of the, the actual philosophy, right? We shouldn't be arguing during a training session. You know, either he, either he or she isn't in compliance with how we want to do it or they're physically not able, ready to want to do it, right? But, there has to be a certain energy in the room for growth. You know what I mean? Um, so manage the appetite. Uh, make sure we give them breaks and time off. Sports shouldn't be a year-long thing. Even me as an organizational leader, as a program director, my kids don't do certain things between, especially my baseball players, they don't do certain things between the months of November and Fed January. We don't throw. Um, if we are doing, we're conditioning, we're running, we're stretching. You know, we're learning the body, the, the body maintenance part, learning how to do band work, bungees. So take the time out to understand that an athlete needs a multitude of different things, right? And playing every week and training every day are not the most important things that they need, right? An athlete needs a competitive fire. And they also need to understand that it is a marathon. You get what I mean? It's not a sprint. You're not going to get, I don't care who the guy is, you're not going to learn that one thing today that's going to make them a, pro, a major league player, right? Because that one thing that's going to get them there is going to be desire over time and energy over time and focus over time. It's not one thing today that you can get accomplished or, or, or accumulate that's going to like be the key to $50 million contract. You know what I mean? So, it's all about that slow, steady progress, slow, steady progress. That's my two cents. You know what I mean? Manage the appetite, give them time off. Um, and then two, last thing I do want to say, God told me this. He said, Mike Tyson's mom wasn't yelling, get your hands up from the corner. You dig what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, when the kid is in an, in an when the kid or the athlete is in a competitive environment, don't combat them with that kind of competitive energy it's not fair right because they're juiced up and they're ready and they're amped up and then you want to question their 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 what they did right let's judge them on their energy and on their on their 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 ability to like go hard let's not like be so critical of how they did what they were doing because they're still learning i tell all of my my parents if you're gonna ask them a question make it over ice cream and make sure you pose it as a question you know, don't don't tell them what they did and yell at them right after the game. You know what I mean? Create the environment where you can actually get some feedback. But if you find it's just like if you mess a mistake and your mic went off and you had a bad show and somebody was like, dang, Corey, you had a bad show. What were you thinking? They're confronting you in an aggressive situation and you're going to like defend yourself because you're already in that competitive mind state. So let's make sure that we give them the space to decompress before we start asking these questions, you know what I'm saying? And realize at the end of the day, as a parent, we're investing in life lessons, not pro athletes. You know what I'm saying? These are skills that they're developing that would go regardless of whether they're going to be pros or not, are going to serve them. So you're not investing this money because we're telling you, you're going to be a pro star. These are translatable skills and personality traits that they'll use for their entire life. So you already going, you already getting what you're paying for. You know what I mean? Um, and um, but that's it for me, man. I think those those points will, will allow parents and kids to kind of like manage and matriculate through this this maze of, of of youth athletics that they've created. Definitely, man. And thanks for coming on Black Men Sundays, John Paul Reed. We appreciate you, appreciate your time. I do have one disagreement though. If my wife made fried chicken every night for a month. 
I just changed up the hot sauce. I think I'll still be all right, though. At the, age I, I am, at the age I am now, though. I respect that. Yeah, you know, small wins making mean a lot at our age. You feel me? I had to agree with that. Yes, sir. As long as it's crispy, I'm good to go. So thanks for coming on Black Man Sundays, brother. And enjoy your week, man. Thank you so much, man. I'll be in touch. It's a Black Man Sunday.